joining us today and welcome to this webinar on building intelligent serverless applications using machine learning and Azure Functions. We've got some great content planned for you today. And before we jump right into it, uh, my name is Asavri. I'll be one of your presenters today. I'm a program manager on the Azure Functions team. Joining me is Priya Ananta Shankar from the commercial software engineering team who will be talking to us about some real-world customer samples and examples. So let's get started. Here's a little snippet of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll, we'll see what serverless is and more specifically, what about Azure Functions. Since this is a serverless session, we'll jump into a little introduction of machine learning to ensure everyone's up to speed with this up and coming technology. We'll also talk about how Azure Functions is applicable to different aspects of ML, specifically to the stages of inferencing and model deployment. And then lastly, and most importantly, most interestingly, we'll discuss a few real life customer examples of reference architectures for using Azure Functions for machine learning scenarios. All right, uh, so without much further ado, the first thing I want to talk about is what Azure Functions is. For those of you not familiar, Azure Functions at its core is serverless compute. And if you're not familiar with the term serverless, we'll get into it right in a moment here. But the whole idea is that uh, you bring your code to Azure, regardless of whether it's written in .NET, JavaScript, Java, or even Python, you give your code to Azure and we'll run and manage it for you, uh, driven by events and at scale. Uh, when I say driven by events, besides giving your code to Azure, you also tell us uh, when to invoke your code, whether it's on an HTTP request, when a new item is added to a blog storage, or when a new item is added to queue, we'll go ahead and execute your function for you. Along with being able to execute this function in Azure serverlessly, we also provide an integrated developer experience with uh, tools such as Visual Studio, VS Code, and even the cross-platform CLI. So you can have an entire DevOps experience without having to worry much, much about uh, whether you're publishing to a server, to a Docker container, to a VM, et cetera. All right, so now that we have an understanding of what Azure Functions is, let's take a look at what serverless means. And at, at its core, what serverless really is, is an abstraction of servers. There are still servers in the background. Everything's running on regular silicon. Um, but what we're really saying is uh, with serverless applications, you don't have to be on point uh, for worrying about the uptime availability and capacity planning for servers. You can leave all of that up to uh, the providers of serverless applications, uh, which in this case is Azure. Serverless apps are typically driven by events. Since there are no dedicated um, VMs running your application, we need to draw a, contact, uh, a contract to understand when to provision resources. So this contract comes in the form of events. So uh, if there are lots of HTTP requests coming in for your application, we'll go up and spin up resources and scale them up to, mean, uh, to uh, meet that demand. And when the traffic goes back down, uh, similarly, we'll scale back down to serve the lower demand. And the whole point uh, of having the serverless infrastructure is so that we can save you cost. So you only pay for the time that your application is running or your functions executing and any resources that it might be using in the cloud. And with Azure, we understand that even serverless applications don't exactly run in vacuum. They do need supporting services to be able to uh, use a comprehensive solution. So here's a little snippet of what the serverless platform at Azure looks like. At its very center, as you can see, is Azure Functions, which is our core functions as a service serverless offering. Accompanying Azure Functions is EventGrid. EventGrid is a single simple interface to help you manage all your cloud events in uh, Azure. And then thirdly, we've got Azure Logic Apps, which is a workflow engine. It lets you produce uh, workflows from as simple as when a new item is added to my blob storage, I'd like to go ahead and process it, to more complicated ones such as when a new lead is added to my CRM system, go ahead and send them a welcome email and also produce a list of tasks in my TFS. 
So those are the three main components of the platform. These help you produce serverless applications. Accompanying, the, accompanying these components are uh, the Cosmos DB database, which is our elastic scale database in Azure, um, Azure storage and Azure automation, as well as the intelligent Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes services suite uh, that helps you do things like custom vision, computer vision, OCR, uh, text recognition, etc. And then finally, to help you secure your applications, we provide Azure AD, um, as well as Azure IoT to help you manage your connected devices. Those are the main components of the platform that uh, form our complete serverless uh, suite of services. To help you build these applications, we also provide an integrated experience uh, for development using tools such as Visual Studio, VS Code, Azure DevOps, and even application insights for monitoring. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit. Now that we have an understanding of what serverless is and what Azure Functions is, let's, uh, let's take a look at what about machine learning. It's a buzzword that's thrown around very often, so it's important to understand what we really mean when we say machine learning. At its core, machine learning is the process of examining vast amounts of data to recognize patterns, and then using that knowledge to recognize the same patterns in brand new data that our system may not have ever seen before. So if I gave my system a bunch of images and told it, hey, this is an apple, this is an orange, or uh, this is a banana, our system understands how to recognize these fruits. And when it sees a brand new image of an apple, it's able to uh, recognize those patterns and uh, draw the information uh, back to the patterns that we've recognized before in order to say that this is an apple. Okay, um, so what does the process of machine learning look like then? So let's take a look. Um, this is a comprehensive diagram, so we'll break it down into multiple pieces and try to understand uh, the different steps in the process. So the very first process of machine learning is data processing. What this means is to be able to uh, do any kind of machine learning, you do need to train your system to understand patterns. You need to give it a data set, a vast uh, data set of uh, information to help, uh, help train the model. Um, the important part here is that the data set needs to be relevant to the algorithm or to the patterns that you're trying to recognize. The more accurate or the more vast your data set is, uh, the more likely is your algorithm uh, to be more accurate. No data set that we uh, take will always be in the form that we want to consume. You'll often find information that's conflicting. There, there could be duplicate information. There could be missing information. You do need to trim these out in order to obtain a precise and accurate data set. This is typically done using uh, data preprocessing modules, uh, using different libraries for Python and R. So that's the first step. Let's take a look at the second step. That's of model training. Once we've got a data set that's ready to be consumed, the next step is to find uh, the right statistical algorithm in order to train your model. Data scientists will typically, typically go back and forth between different combinations of the data set and the algorithm in order to find the model that's most accurate. So a model is basically a piece of code that's capable of recognizing patterns in brand new data. So if it's already seen a data set before, it can go ahead and try to find the same patterns in brand new data. And then finally, once we've obtained the model, the most important uh, step is to go ahead and deploy that model as part of our application so it can make so it can start making predictions on new input. This is the process of model deployment, also referred to as model inference. So what are the different steps uh, in machine learning? We are, sorry, what are the different roles in machine learning? We already saw the different stages of machine learning, which is data processing, model training, and model deployment. But who actually performs these steps? While well, data processing and model training is typically the job of a data scientist, 
model deployment falls into both of an application developer. Today, we'll be seeing how we can make the lives of an application developer easier uh, using Azure functions for the data processing and the model deployment stages. So let's go ahead and jump into the data processing part. The very first step in data processing is being able to connect to data sources. Whether your data lives in Cosmos DB, Azure SQL, or any of the other cloud sources, you need to be able to connect to these sources from within your application to obtain the data. With Azure Functions, we have this unique concept of triggers and bindings that let you connect to these data sources, whether they're first party or third party data sources, simply by adding bindings without having to get into the nitty gritty details or what the underlying SDK or authentication mechanism is. When you're executing your code, you can go ahead and add an input binding either as a trigger or as an additional binding so you can say, hey, when, my, um, when a new item is added to my blob storage, I'd like to go ahead and pull the contents of that blob into my function for execution. And hey, while I'm executing my code, also go and fetch some information from my Cosmos DB table in order to um, execute the logic. While you're executing, at the same time, you can also go ahead and write back to any of the data sources. And these could, again, be any of your Azure services or third-party services, such as uh, Twilio for sending a text message or even SendGrid. The whole idea is that a trigger executes. It goes ahead and invokes your function. You pull in any data from additional input bindings that you may have, and your function can also go ahead and return data to a third um, output binding or a data source. Okay, so that was the data processing part. Let's go ahead and look at the inferencing on model deployment. And just to recap, we, we saw when a trained model is obtained from a data set and an algorithm, the final step in the process is to go ahead and deploy that model as part of an application in order to make predictions. This step, or model deployment, is referred to as inferencing. A few important uh, factors or requirements for inferencing is, firstly, you need to be able to easily deploy your model. Uh, so you can encourage iteration over models uh, for new data data inputs and to incorporate any changes to the algorithm. Second, in order to make predictions, your application needs to be able to fetch input from various data sources. This would be similar to, to, the, uh, to the concept of triggers and bindings we saw earlier. Um, so your input could be coming from something like an HTTP request or even an IoT hub or an event hub for the Third, uh, we do need to uh, trigger a prediction based on an event. Uh, so when new data is added or when a new input is obtained, our application needs to know to pull that information from that trigger or input and go ahead and um, execute a prediction on that input. So our application needs to be event driven. And lastly, most importantly, most often our models train using Python or R without a, a simple API surface to be able to make predictions from another runtime or stack such as JavaScript or .NET. So the best way to be able to build a serverless application to serve predictions or to run an inference against a model is to build an application in Python or R. The good news today is Azure Functions is now announcing support for Python in public preview. This means you can go ahead and build your Python build your Azure Functions using Python 3.6 based on the Functions 2.0 runtime. You can publish these function apps to a serverless Linux hosting platform based on Service Fabric Mesh in Azure. Since it is a serverless application, you don't have to be worried about uh, whether it's running on Service Fabric Mesh or in a container. Um, all you do is give us your Python code and dependencies, and we'll run it in Azure serverlessly for you. And since 
Azure Functions provides an integrated experience with Visual Studio Code. You can develop your, you can develop debug test and publish your functions right from the VS Code IDE using the Azure Functions extension, or you can also use the cross-platform uh, cross Azure CLI to publish. So let's jump right into a demo of what uh, Python functions look like and how we can use this feature to build a machine learning application in Azure. All right, uh, so let's take a look at this function app. I've got a functions project in VS Code that will take input from blob storage about a customer that's been added to a system and go ahead and run it against a pre-trained pre model to help determine whether this customer is likely to churn or not. So I've got a function project here, and this is the equivalent of a function app in Azure. Essentially, a function app can contain multiple functions that share the same local and hosting configuration. So let's go ahead and look at the actual function here. And we've got a couple of files uh, that we'll explain in just a moment. Uh, let's start with the function JSON. Function JSON is basically the place where you define any of the binding, uh, bindings that your function may be using. In this case, we'll be using input from a blob trigger. And so we've described the different uh, configuration details for the blob trigger, including the Azure storage account connection string and the container that we'll be monitoring for input. We'll give it a name, um, my blob, that will be used to reference the method attribute. So with that, the init.py is the Python script that will be defining the actual Python uh, the Python function or the logic that we'll be invoking when a new item is added to blob. Within the Python script, the very first step we'll take is to go ahead and initiate the pre-trained model. And you can see I've got the a uh, pickled model file right here as a binary in my function app. I can go ahead and initiate the model uh, in order to start using it for prediction. The next step after initiating the model is to go ahead and uh, process the data coming from the blob storage um, in order to remove um, any conflicting information or extra information that may be irrelevant to the process of making a prediction. For that, we'll use the prep function right here. You can, you, you can see we uh, will be using the pandas library in order to frame this as a pandas data frame. So take up the input uh, and go ahead and output that as a data frame, which is what we return to our main function. Once we've obtained the processed data from our function, we can go ahead and run a prediction against the formatted data using the predict helper. The predict helper will in turn go ahead and encode any of the columns that may be relevant to our algorithm, and this process basically takes the uh, columns and converts them to values that are interpretable by our uh, algorithm for prediction. So once we've um, processed the formatted data for prediction, we we'll go ahead and return this as JSON output back to our main function, which can then go ahead and print information to the console about whether the customer is likely to churn or um, simply will continue as a happy customer. So let's go ahead and F5 into this function to start the function's runtime uh, and execute a Python code. It's important to note here that we're running this function completely locally. Given that the Azure function's runtime is open source, we provided the ability to run the function's runtime on any platform of your choice, be it uh, Windows OS, Linux OS, or even for that matter, you could containerize the runtime and uh, run it in Azure uh, as a container itself. So now that our functions host has started, we can go ahead back to Azure and upload a customer file Let's go ahead and upload a couple of customer records. 
to see whether these customers are likely to churn or not, and then we'll monitor the logs on our local instance. In our demo example here, we can see most of our customers are happy, unlikely to churn if we did have um, uh, information that indicated that the customer was going to churn, we, we would have had um, a 1.0 uh, return from our algorithm, which would have indicated that the customer is likely to churn. And that's it. I can go ahead and stop my debugger and let's switch back over to the slides. With that, I'll hand over to Priya, who will uh, show us a few examples of scenarios that you could implement using machine learning and Azure Functions. Hi, everyone. Um, so before I start uh, describing these scenarios, um, I just wanted to say that when Python on Functions was announced private preview, uh, me and my team at Commercial Software Engineering, we started investigating uh, Python on functions against uh, real customer scenarios. And uh, we also try to validate some of the points and give feedback uh, to the functions team. So the scenarios that I'm going to be showing are uh, actual customer scenarios and asks, uh, which we've tried to validate and we have successfully validated as well. Um, it also spans across text and custom vision. So let me go over the first scenario, which is on um, a natural language. So as uh, Asavari said, um, we always have a pre-trained workflow which involves cleaning of your data. So you have these documents uh, from a customer and these documents are full of um, FAQs and pages uh, uh, for their IT support. And what we needed to do was to clean up these documents to find only those relevant words and then store the clean documents to the blob. So that's going to be our pre-trained workflow right at the bottom that you see here, where we clean these documents using uh, libraries like NLTK, which is Natural Language Toolkit in Python, and also using SPACI, uh, which is a um, industrial strength uh, natural language processing library in Python. And we used functions to take these documents and clean them up. When I say clean, what we usually mean is to remove stop words, which are like used, remove frequently used words like the and 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 stuff like that and remove all that noise and, and also lemmatize those words. And these libraries offer very good in interfaces to, to do the same. And that's our pre-trained workflow where the documents are clean. And, and we did use Azure functions um, uh, with Python uh, uh, to, do, to do the same. And we, after cleaning the data, we moved to training the data. So, the, the bigger question here is how did, can we use functions to actually train data? Uh, yes and no, you could use it to train smaller sets of data as long as it fits within the serverless uh, time frame, uh, as long as the training time fits within the time frame of serverless paradigm that we follow. And, and we had like this really small set of documents that we wanted to train. So we loaded the clean data from the blob and we had an HTTP trigger which actually used GenSim, which is a library um, which can train and find out topics. So for topic modeling out of this data, we used the LDA statistical modeling algorithm, which is latent Dirichlet allocation. This is a statistical model algorithm which will cluster similar parts of data together. So that's what the customer was looking, looking forward to. He was looking to get a bunch of documents and, and get a bunch of similar topics out of those documents. And that's our training workflow, which also used an Azure function uh, to, to actually train and produce a topic model, which is a model which identifies similar parts of these documents. And for the test workflow, which is the inference, we just throw a random document at this model, which is already trained, and it's going to tell us which topic this document belongs to. 
which also gives us an idea that this particular document belongs to a specific topic uh, like you know a backing up of your devices or or uh, uh, doing a, like a cleanup of your document so that's the kind of topic modeling that we experimented with and this is a complete text example using azure functions on python and helped us identify areas of how easy it is to deploy um, uh, existing uh, NLTK libraries into the, into a functions paradigm, how easy it is to download your existing corpora that exists as part of your NLTK uh, toolkit. The next example is on custom vision. So here we have an example where we have a bunch of images thrown at a model which is already pre-trained using TensorFlow and functions is just used to do inference from that model. The actual scenario out here is a customer who has a model which is based on, based on TensorFlow uh, which is based, trained on a lot of images uh, related to the customer's product. It could be garments, it could be pictures of landscapes, so any of these. And the customer had a pre-trained model which is already built on TensorFlow and we're just throwing a bunch of images against this function and this model which is loaded as part of the function app uh, to do inference out of these images. So here, is, this is a pretty simple workflow but the challenge here is to see how big of a model can you bundle in with a function app and uh, you know how how bursty are these calls are they frequent calls are they a lot of calls over time and then look at how the function app is doing so these were a couple of things that we validated using this workflow and this generally um, is a scenario that we use to see would we want GPUs in serverless or would we want a cluster or a container or would, would just this suffice? And, and it looks like just to do basic inference using images, uh, it would be super easy to kind of bundle your TensorFlow model along with the function app and just deploy without having to worry about a whole lot of cluster maintenance and, and it's also a low cost solution. Um, the third scenario is pretty similar. Um, it's more a little bit of automation involved in it where you have a bunch of license plates uh, which, which is where we have images of license plates which is passed into an event grid um, because as and when these plates are, are photographed, that's when you want to recognize what plates are these and what vehicles are these. So you have an event grid in the middle which is actually calling through a, an Azure function through an HTTP web hook. And these, these function, this particular function is trained using OpenCV which is a vision library and Keras which is a, which is a library on top of TensorFlow to identify uh, the image, the vehicle, the vehicle make, and, and stuff like that. So this is also like a, a real world scenario that we encountered where the customer wanted ease of hosting and scalability. I think that's pretty much uh, what we're looking for here with functions. Like you do not want to maintain images or you, don't, you do not want to maintain clusters. Um, you just have a simple image that you want to infer out of and, and this could suffice for such cases. And you also have these bots which are augmented with cognitive services out here which will use, which uses ML to actually capture and give some extra metadata to this event grid and that's the data source part which Savary was talking about where you're able to combine a whole lot of data sources plus inference algorithms to run on functions and, and get the maximum benefit out of it. With these workflows, um, I'm going to hand it over back to Asavari uh, for some takeaways. Thank you, Priya. Um, all right, so that was the session. Really, the point we were trying to um, draw home today is that 
Uh, so much means that you can accomplish a whole lot more in lesser time since you can now stop worrying about the infrastructure pieces of your application and really start to focus on the underlying logic or the business value that you're producing. Functions can help uh, simplify the process of uh, data pre-processing and model deployment specifically for machine learning applications or inferencing scenarios. Azure Functions now supports Python, which means um, all the ML logic that you've always been trying to build as a serverless application is now possible using Python and Azure Functions. You can check out the link um, on the screen, aka.ms functions Python preview to find more information and get started. Find us on Twitter at Azure Functions uh, to get more information and give us your feedback. We look forward to chatting with you. Thank you. All right, thank you both so much for that great presentation. So it looks like we are now just reaching the end of our time limit here today. So we're gonna to need to bring this session to a close in just a few minutes. But before we do that, it looks like we have had some great questions come through the console. So we're gonna spend the next uh, 10, 15 or 20 or so minutes just going through our list of questions and doing our best to address everything that comes in within the time frame. So also, if you have not asked a question, now is the time to do so, and we will get to everything we can. So as mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we would really appreciate uh, your feedback on the survey that you'll see at the bottom right-hand side of your webinar screen. And this is very valuable feedback to us. This will help us determine the sort of webinars we'll be putting out in the future, and will also let us know how you enjoyed the webinar today, and a few other things like that. So again, the Q&A window is open.